The next point, upon the first day of the week, I will give tithes and offerings as God has prospered me during the week. All right, so I'm going to give one from the New Testament. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. There's a number of scriptures here, but I'll just do that one. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 16, verse 2. It reads as follows. And Paul is very specific here. He says... Um, upon the first day of the week, which proves that people came to church in the scriptures on the what? First day of the week. Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. He appeared to his disciples on the first day of the week. And the Holy Ghost came on the first day of the week. So obviously they gathered on the first day of the week. Right? So, um, Hold your point. We'll be able to get into it after, right? So, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay, lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there'll be no gatherings when I come. Because Paul comes to preach. He wants to preach. He does not want his time to be wasted in gathering money from, from the people, okay? So, the practice of gathering funds or or that which is in store, what people had, as bartering or whatever it is that they gave towards the work of the Lord, it was done, and it was done on the first day of the week, certainly amongst Gentiles, okay? Certainly amongst Gentiles. Um, back in the days of the apostles, um, they were Judeans, okay? All 12 apostles were of the 12 tribes of Israel, primarily Judeans, which is... Judah, Benjamin, half the tribe of Levi. Now, as such, as such, they would gather on the Sabbath. Because that breaking away from the, the body of Yeshua, the church, the followers of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, and the, Jew, uh, uh, the faith of the, the Old Testament, they were still intertwined. God allowed persecution to, to kind of cause that to dissipate, that kind of a connection to break away. And so, excuse me, the church started to go away from adhering to the laws of Moses and the temple. Okay? When I say the laws of Moses, I'm talking about the ordinances and the statutes and the ceremonial laws, that sort of thing. Of course, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments were still practiced. Now, as Paul preached amongst the Gentiles, um, he would preach them on the first day of the week. As a matter of fact, him and Barnabas, they would go to the Sabbath day. Holy people came uh, one day to, to hear the word of God being preached. And the Judeans, they were very upset and very jealous that the whole of the city came out to hear the preaching of the gospel by the Apostle Paul and, the, and Barnabas. And they stirred up noble women and men of renown against the apostles because they were jealous. They didn't believe that the gospel should go to the Gentiles. So the apostle Paul, you'll find this in Acts chapter 13. He said it was, it was meet, it was appropriate for us to preach first to you Judeans. But seeing that you count yourself unworthy to receive the gospel of Yahushua Mashiach, Jesus Christ, we turn to the Gentiles because God has appointed us to do so. As says the scriptures in the book of Isaiah and other scriptures that says the Gentiles, the Gentiles shall trust in his name. And David is quoted in Psalm 86 verse 9 um, where he speaks and says, All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship thee, O God, and shall magnify thy name. So the Apostle Amen. Paul was quoting the Old Testament, when he said this to these Judeans that were upset that the, gospels were, was, the gospel was being preached to the Gentiles. And so he says, we're turning to the Gentiles. So they started to gather on the first day of the week. And the Lord started blessing those congregations. And many of them were baptized in the name of Yahushua, Mashiach, Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit. And miracles was done about them. 
And Paul and Barnabas went to Jerusalem and told the apostles what they were doing amongst the Gentiles. And would you know, there were Judeans that were saying, look, they've got to keep the law of Moses and they've got to worship on the, 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 on the Sabbath day. And the apostles and elders got together and you see the, the, the result of this conference in Acts chapter 15. When the chairman of the board of that conference was James, the Lord Jesus' half-brother, right? He said, look, Simon, Simeon, which is the Apostle Peter, hath declared how that God hath visited the Gentiles to pick out of them a people for his name. So we're telling you right now, they, they do not trouble the Gentiles with things that pertain to the law. They are free. I won't get into it in detail, but they're free. They do not have to worship on the Sabbath day. They do not have to um, circumcise their, their male children. They don't have to do these things. Just don't drink blood. Don't eat things strangled. Do not um, eat things offered to idols and stay impure. Do not commit fornication. Other than that, you're good to go, Gentiles. You don't have to keep anything more in the law amongst the, the, um, the law. And the prophets don't have to do it. The nation of Israel couldn't keep it. Why are they going to put that on the Gentiles? Freedom is in Yeshua Mashiach. When you have Jesus, you have everything. You have everything. Now, I'm not going to say worshiping on the Sabbath day is, is a bad thing. No. But you do not need to do that to be saved. I wonder why God is having me go into this. It needs to be clear. One does not have to worship on the Sabbath day to be saved. Because in the times of Moses, anyone that broke the Sabbath was stoned to death. If that was the case today, most people would be dead before they could even come out, the, 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 out of the house because the Holy Ghost came on the first day of the week. The people were gathered to worship on the first day of the week. And we're talking Sabbath day people. So, what does the Word of God speak about the Sabbath? I will quote what the Apostle Paul spoke in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. He said, Let no man judge you in meat or in drink, or in feast days, or in the new moons, or in the holy days, or in the Sabbath days, which were a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Jesus Christ. We gather to worship the Lord on any day of the week. We're free. Could be on the last day of the week. But Sabbath for a child of God because I keep the Sabbath, I keep it on Saturday, I keep it on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, every day of the week. Sabbath is living in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, so I don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation, none at all, to them that are in Christ Jesus, that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And what was the law of sin and death? The law that Moses instituted in Israel. Because if you broke it, you died. Matter of fact, when he came out the mount with the Ten Commandments, it was already broken. He threw it down, broke the thing, and 3,000 people were killed because they broke it. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people received baptism in the name of Yeshua in Jesus Christ and received the Holy Ghost empowered by eternal life. So the law of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So I can worship God on any day of the week. So Sabbath is life in the Spirit, free from sin. When God convicts you of sin, you put away the sin. Don't go back to it. Hallelujah. Therefore, you're free. Am I saying something to somebody? Some, it, this needs to be clear. Don't let anyone tell you you have to do this on the Sabbath day. You do not. We live Sabbath every day of the week, a life free from habitual sin. Be ye holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. So we still keep the Ten Commandments. But Sabbath is every day of the week. Because Jesus said, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you Sabbath. I will give you rest. And he preached to Judeans. He did not preach to Gentiles. So if they were keeping the Sabbath, he wouldn't have to say that. They're keeping the day, but they weren't keeping the lifestyle. Matter of fact, everyone that con con condemned Jesus 
They were all Sabbath day keepers. They, they broke the Sabbath. They said, crucify him. Let his blood be upon us and our children. They broke the Sabbath. They broke the laws of Moses. It was an illegal judgment. They, they, they should not execute someone on Passover. <laughs> Everything was broken at the execution of our Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone that said crucify him, they all kept the Sabbath. So if that was going to save anyone, they would have recognized that they should not keep this accusation against Jesus and say, he says he's the son of God, but he's not. They would have recognized him because he's the Lord of the Sabbath. But on keeping their Sabbath day still didn't help them from sinning against God. And to this day, we Judeans are still suffering from that edict that was passed against our Lord. Let his blood be upon us and our children. We're suffering today because of that, as a people, as Judeans. So my friends, first day of the week, last day of the week, you can worship on any day of the week, says the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now if you come, whether it's on the Sabbath day or the first day of the week, you bring your tithes and offering so that you can bless the house of God. And we have enough of scriptures in the Old Testament, one of which was uh, Jacob in Genesis chapter 28, the last verse, I think it's 22, where he says, if the Lord is going to be with me and keep me in the way I go, so that I come again to my father's place in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And whatsoever he gives me, I will surely give the tenth unto him. That was before the law of Moses. Moses was in the loins of, of Jacob when Jacob made that de declaration unto the Lord. So that giving of tithes was before the law was given. It was before the law, during the law, and after the law in the church. And of course, we know Malachi chapter 3, uh, verse 8 to 12, where the Lord says, this whole nation has robbed me because they did not give me tithes and offerings. So the work of the house of God has left bare because the Levites and priests, they now work in the fields like every regular person. Now, I know there's some preachers don't, they, they, they don't, they, some, not all, but some say, oh, uh, nobody should be paid to work to, 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 to preach the gospel. Let me tell you something. Jesus said in, uh, when was it? Luke chapter 10, verse seven, the laborer is worthy of his hire. Okay. The Apostle Paul covers it also in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He spoke and said in verse 13 and 14, Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live off the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live off the gospel. What does that mean? It means they got to get paid for what they do. It's work. It's work. Now, I don't mean that people should go overboard and, you know, some of the things I'm seeing, on it's just disgusting. I ain't talking that. I'm talking honest men of God, true men of God that are worthy of such. They ought to live off the gospel because it's work. Most people don't even understand fully the kind of work that people of God actually do in order to deliver faithfully the word of God and to be conduits of God's miracles amongst the people of God. It takes work. It's dedication. It's giving yourself, it's studying to show yourself approved unto God. It's no piece of cake. And if it was, everybody would be doing it. But quite frankly, there are people that give themselves to the work of the Lord and they ought to be remunerated according to the scripture. Now, the Apostle Paul didn't do it in the Corinthians church because that was a rich church and there was a lot of charlatans that was going there to preach so that they can get money because they knew that they would get a whole lot of money. So Paul kind of put a stop to that, or tried to, by saying, I'm not taking tithes from you. But he took tithes from other churches, poorer churches, who supplied his needs, one of which was the Philippian church. So nobody can come to tell me that Paul did not get sustained. Yes, he did, especially when he, he was in prison. They'd send things for him. So no. Then he had to even apologize to the Corinthians and say, I should have taken from you. I'm just paraphrasing here. He says, I... I did you wrong, I should have taken from you. But I did it so that these charlatans would not, you know, would not take advantage of you. So I won't get into that, but 
That's what happened. So it is right, it is good to give to the house of God. Praise the Lord. I'm just going to go real quick with other things. I'm just going to mention a few things. I'm going to skip some of these points because time is going. Okay. Um, let's see. I will not stir strife and war amongst the saints, but will live peaceable and do my best to help them to live in harmony. The brethren, that is. Okay. I have a lot of scriptures in Proverbs because I just love the Proverbs of King Solomon. Um, but let me just uh, just say one scripture here. Uh, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 3. Let me just look at that quickly. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 3. Let's see what it says here. King Solomon quotes and says... It is an honor for a man to cease from strife, but every fool will be meddling, looking for a fight. Come out before me so that we can fight together. Yeah. <laughs> the Bible calls people who likes to fight fools. Like to get in argument? You're a fool. A fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So guess what? They might be declaring it with their mouths. They might think it with their minds. But in their heart, God is not there. You like to fight? You're a fool. Straight up, King Solomon said it by the Holy Ghost being upon him to write this word. I'll repeat it. It's so powerful. It is an honor for a man to cease from strife. But every fool will be meddling, looking for a fight, picking Words that are strifeful and, 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 and trying to pick something because there's no peace in their hearts. Mm. Wow, I can get deep on this, trust me, but I, I, I'll just leave it at that. You get the idea. Let's go to another point here. I will not be a busybody. Oh, this is big. I will not be a busybody or a tattler, a gossiper. This is deep. Watch this one. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 18, verse 8. Seeing that we're in Proverbs already. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 8. What does it say? The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Oh, that hurts just reading it. <laughs> you speak something against someone, the poor person doesn't even know you're speaking against them. They come around you, hi, how are you doing? And everyone's just looking at you. Yeah, hi. Right. And you're cut. Okay? It's not right. It's not right. That's murder. You're murdering with your tongue. Let's look at another one. Uh, let's see here. Verse 20 of the same chapter. Uh, no, that's not what it means. That's not what it says. Okay, so let me just go to Proverbs chapter 25. Is it 25? Yes, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 8 to 10. No, that's another topic, sorry. So, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 19. That's the one I want to look at, because I'm right there. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 19. He that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets. Therefore, meddle not with him that flattereth with his, with his lips. Did you hear that? This is the kind of person that will come to you talking about someone else. And when you listen to them, they never talk about what they do. That's wrong. Everybody else is wrong except them because they're perfect. Well, I'm going to tell you what they will do. They'll take your business Go to someone else and tell them about you. I have seen this time and time again. I'm telling you, they're just feeding you with gossip about this person and that person and that one and this one and that one and that one. And then when you watch them, and I'm telling you, I've seen this. The people have come to me, tell me stuff. And then 
when I speak the word of God and show what is right, that person don't like it and they go start spreading rumors about me. Did you hear what I said? I have been a victim of these kind of people. They'll come to you telling you all the woes and everything else and telling what this one and that one's done to them. But guess what? There's a saying. Somebody told me this, a friend of mine, way back, a couple of decades ago. He said, the dog that brings a bone into your yard will take that bone and put it in someone else's yard. Interesting. Now, it's not to say that all things are wrong. There's, a, you know, if you can prove something that's been said, then you should warn something, someone about some bad stuff. Absolutely. If there's proof about it. If it's a proven fact. But he said, she said, and everyone, and, and your brother said, no. Don't make your ears a garbage bin. Weigh what is said to you. Look into the matter so that you can be, your heart can be right before God. And don't make your ears a garbage bin. I'm telling you now. Because God doesn't like it. And don't make your mouth a tail, be a tailbearer. Don't do it. Because God doesn't like it. God does not like it. I can get very deep in this, but I've got to move on. I'm winding up. All right. Oh, I will not take my brother or sister in the Lord before the law of courts, but will take them to the church in matters that we cannot settle amongst ourselves. So a brother or sister, don't take them to court. Watch this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 to 8. This is very important. A lot of people don't know this. So I'm going to have to read it. So it's very plain. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is why people must be very careful who they do business with. Get God's guidance and, you know, you'll be all right. Right. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world be judged by you, are you un unworthy to judge the smallest matter? The smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? Angels. How much more things that pertain to this life? If then we ye have judgment of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother, go after the law with brother and that before the unbelievers. Now there is, there is utterly a fault among you because you go to, to law one with another. Why do ye not take the wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Yea, you do wrong and defraud and that your brethren. Is that plain? certainly is. There are some people, I will say this, that are so unruly in church and they, they're thieves, they're deceitful. They're in the congregation. They're not in the church. Paul is not speaking about people like that. Okay? He's talking about saved people taking brother and sister to court. Not someone that's just in the congregation and is not saved and they're just looking for an opportunity to slight someone. One has to be wise, one has to be careful. But if it can be solved amongst the brethren in the church, it should be. And there are specific ways of doing this that the Word of God clearly states. Praise the Lord. All right, let me just move on. I will always report to the church whenever I'm sick, okay, so that you can be prayed for. The word of God says in James chapter 5, verse 14 to 18, let the sick call for the elders of the assembly, let them pray for them, and the prayer of the faith, prayer of faith shall save the, the sick. And if they've committed any sins, it shall be forgiven them. That's what it says in James. So report when you're sick so you can get prayed for. Don't suffer in silence. That's not necessary, okay? Praise the Lord. 
Let me tell you this, by the way. In every qualified, authentic church, there's somebody there in the midst that have the gift of healing. Jesus. Someone there that can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Because this is what Jesus said. These signs shall follow them that believe. This is Mark chapter 16, verse 16 and 17. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall pick up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. This is the word of God. If it's not happening, that is not the church. Straight goods. There is power in the blood of Jesus. The Holy Ghost power that can conquer any kind of thing that Satan might throw at the people of God. The prayer of faith shall heal the sick. And if any have sin, it shall be forgiven them. Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus. Next point. I will. All right now. I will do my best to grow my children in the fear and admonition of the Lord and be a perfect example before them. Mm -hmm. Proverbs chapter 20. 22 verse 6 train up the child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it that's the word of the lord that's the parents responsibilities children are not owned by their parents children are stewarded by the parents parents are stewards of their children they don't own them and as stewards of god's creation in their children they are responsible to bring them up right. Okay? By the fear of the Lord. I can get into this deeply. I've watched my parents bring me up in the Lord, me and my siblings. And even when we strayed, I still came back to my parents. We still came back to my parents. And I personally, I can tell you now, the things that my parents would teach me and I couldn't see it before, I would come back and say, Mom, Dad, you were right. You were right right on and i honored my parents that way because they were right they brought me up in the right way all right sometimes children don't see things the way that life really is and when our parents tell us to do things we don't really listen but when we go out there and we feel it we have to come back and humble ourselves and say hey you know what dad you know what mom i proved that you were right in that thing that's a very good thing to do very good thing to do because children ought to be reared up by godly parents telling them the right thing to do. Amen to that. Let me just move on. Whoa, this is a heavy one because of the culture of the Western world. As a saint, I will dress modestly. This is huge. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. Gotta go there. I'm going to read it. Read it for you people, because this culture in the Western world in particular is way off base. I have to read it to you. Cannot escape this one. Okay. Now I can quote it, but I'm not going to. I'm going to just read it so you know I'm not just pulling this out of my head. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. This is heavy. What we see in culture today, even in churches, it's an abomination. You see some women come up with tight up stuff, man. You can see the, the boobs half hanging out. They, they wearing leg warmers. Is that what they call them? Tights. These, and they're doing the, the whining their butts and everything in church. It is disgusting. And, and they, it, it's an abomination unto the Lord. And they will be reprimanded by God. And it's on the, the pastor's fault. It's the leader's fault. 
they've permitted that to happen in the house of God. Men are to wear, come in looking like men, acting like men, being men. Women are to come into the presence of God looking like women, acting like women, being women. None of this unisex clothing. This is clear in the scriptures. I'll read it again, just so you know. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Let me tell you this. You see the Queen of England? This is something I'm telling you, I admire her so much. You would, I have never seen the Queen in pants. Never. The Queen, Queen Elizabeth II of, of the UK. You will never, you'll, hell will freeze over before you see her in pants. And this is a woman that, you know, is not born again. But she has etiquette. She's a lady. Hallelujah. And she dressed so proper. And you can, you know, when there's a royal pageantry of some kind, you always want to look for the queen. And she's always dressed ladylike. What is going on in the house of God? This lady has standards. And if you come before the queen, you are going to appear in a certain way that's going to accommodate her tastes or else you can't appear before the queen. How much more the most high God? Come on, folks. Get it together. It's an abomination what's going on in many churches today. God is not accepting it. He's a holy God. And just be, you know what the scripture says in Ecclesiastes? Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore it is fully set in the hearts of men to do evil. They think because the sun is shining and everything's cool and there's no wars in this part of the world, everything's fine and we can just go ahead and party in the house of God. Come in the way we want, dress, come as you are, stay as you want. He's a God of love. <laughs> Oh, God, you do not want to see the other side of the Lord. His wrath kindles against the wicked every day. You do not want to see that side of him. You need to read Revelations chapter 20 to see what's going to happen to those that took God for granted. <sighs> it's an abomination to be unisex and dress up with the opposite sex. Clothing. Never mind Hollywood. It's an abomination. Understand that.